progress. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as the Sabbath hours are approaching, at least for me, and we invite your presence. And we are very, very thankful for the light that you have given us this past week. We live in a world that's full of darkness and sin. And um, we know that we need spiritual sight to find our way. We know that sometimes we have these things literally occur um, and we ask for healing um, for those that are suffering and in various ways, not just vision problems, but other health issues, especially health issues that affect our mind and our spiritual health to understand your truth. We know, Lord, that we cannot understand any of these things unless your Holy Spirit teaches us. That we can understand the depths of your word. And we pray for those that are stumbling in darkness. For people in this movement and people in the world and in the church. And we ask, Lord, that you can use us that you can transform our characters so that we can represent your truths in a powerful way. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, for our hardness of heart, the times that we have refused to listen to what your Holy Spirit is saying to us, that we resist that conviction and the power that comes with it. So we just ask, Lord, that as we study together this evening that you can guide and lead us and that we can understand all of these things that you are revealing to us and we pray this in jesus name amen <clears throat> okay um so this chart we're not going to look at today. We did discuss it a little bit before the study. We're going to look at that one on Sunday morning. We have three charts that Stevens produced from our morning studies. And uh, what we're going to look at today, I, I do, I have a plan, as I always do. Rarely do I ever follow it. But it's, it's always important to have a plan when you're going to do a presentation. And... We, we've covered a lot of things. So we really started with call and study uh, back um, a few months ago. And in that study, so that I guess technically call and study was December 25th. So if we're looking at it, we're on March 24th. So tomorrow will be March 25th. So we're looking at three months. And and in that period of time, um, we, we've tried to evaluate as much information as we could. Yeah, and today is, uh, today's 325, right. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow's 326, sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, so 325, so we're three months to the day on uh, the Gregorian calendar from when, uh, from December 25th. And, and so now we want to look at call and study again. So we, we looked at um, the Nero study. Uh, we looked at um, the study by Ralph Myers on 666, dealing with the popes. We looked at the pioneers' understanding of the beasts. But now we want to look at some of Colin's arguments and why I think Colin is essentially correct he's doing and where we're going to start here is um, Daniel chapter 3 so what is the point about Daniel chapter 3 anybody who's followed his studies
What do we understand about Daniel chapter 3? Dwight, do you have something to say? I did. I see you. No. The point with with Daniel chapter three is this is the this is the figure, the gold that is set up on the plain of Dura. Right now, the the point that Colin is making is that there would be a repeat of one of the types that we see as we have read that the eighth was of the seven. Okay. So, he, so he's making an application that this type is going to be repeating. Okay. Now, now that's more involved than, than what I'm asking. All right. I mean, simple question is, if we look at Daniel chapter three, even not what Colin's doing, but what we understand about Daniel chapter three is it's the Sunday law, right? That would be the basic principle there. No disagreement. Okay. Now I, I, I know what you're saying. We're, we're gonna get there of, of what he's saying about the riddle, but even before we get to the riddle, we need to understand why he's looking at Daniel chapter three the way he is. So we all know Daniel chapter 2, the image. That's the head of gold, the arms and breast of silver, uh, uh, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. But this image here is gold all the way through. And so we know that this is Babylon, but it's also the Sunday law. And that Babylon here, that Nebuchadnezzar, is typifying the Sunday law. And we can see that this image made of gold, its height is 36 cubits, and the breadth of it is six cubits. And so what is that? What is this measurement? I'm about 90 feet tall. Okay, but I'm not talking about, well, symbolically, what does it represent? What's three score? Well, Sunday. Yeah, so, so three score is 60. Sunday. Yeah, the Sunday law. So three score is 60, right? And six. Right. So it's 60 cubits by six cubits. Does that symbolize 666 in any way? Yeah, definitely. But if you if you were to multiply the two together, you're also going for 360. Right. Mm -hmm. So 60 times 6 is 360. Right. And, and we know that the number 36 itself, whether it's 360. So the number 666 comes from the fact that there's 36 constellations. And we have the 360 degrees of the horizon. These numbers come from Babylon. These are Babylonian numbers. Okay. And, but and I, the reason why they have the symbol 666 is it's simply adding the constellations 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way up to plus 36 gives us this number 666. Okay. So the, the question that I have to throw back out. Okay. We're agreeing because scripture lies this out that the figure was 60 cubits high yeah are we taking this as a standard cubit or are we taking this as a royal cubit well you would take it as the standard cubit why well because because the royal cubit normally would be connected to the sanctuary so my my question though is is this if we were to take that figure of 60 cubits and multiply it by the royal cubit, what do we come out with? Well, you come up with 1260. Yeah. So Wait. we can do both. We can do both. I mean, as a symbol, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So so we can, so I'll show I'll show you what we're doing here because this is quite important. Um so we're going to have uh 60 cubits 
right? And we're going to multiply it by 18. When we do that, we get this number. This is the number of the parts of the hour or, or the number of the parts of one hour in, in, in the Hebrew calendar because there's 24 hours in a day times this number, and that's going to give you this 25920. That number um, is how they divide the day. It, uh, instead of in seconds and minutes, they divide it into hours, but their hours they divide um, into parts that are three and a third seconds long. So, I mean, we've gone over this before, but this number, um, 1080, shows up in the story in, in Acts 27. When they measure, um, they're going to get two measurements. One's going to be 1080, and that's going to be 15 uh, fathoms which is 1,080 inches, because there's um, 72 inches to a fathom. And then they're going to me measure again, and it's going to be 20 fathoms, and that's going to be 1,440. And 1,440 is the number of parts that we use, the, they're called minutes, to divide the day. And so that these are about time. And of course, if you add the two together, 1,080, plus 1440, you get 2520. So now when we look at this image here, that 60, um, 60 cubits, and we just multiply its height by either 18 or, so if we multiplied it by 18, it was 1080, but if we multiply it by the royal cubit, it's 1260, right? So again, we have measurements that relate to time, one is a symbol of time, 1080. And then we have another symbol of time, which is the years, prophetic years. So, so we see these symbols. And we see these symbols also in, in uh, Daniel chapter 4 and in Daniel chapter 5, right? So chapter 3, 4, and 5 in connection with Babylon are going to give us these symbols that are going to be related to spiritual Babylon at the end. Right? That's how we would understand it? I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. The okay. Point, the point that I'm looking at. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar understood that he was to be the head of gold. Mm -hmm. So he was to be the first or the most primary kingdom of that in world history, as mm -hmm. Lloyd Daniels pointed out to him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if 60 by 21 gives us 1260, yeah. 6 by 21 is going to give us 126. Right. 110. So, so we're dealing with a situation that this figure is representative of, I agree, the 2520, but also of the 1260. And mm -hmm. the 1260 is, is pointing directly to the the beast that would come later right in in revelation chapter 13 exactly yeah so 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 these are important points that we have to look at if we're going to understand what's being symbolized here and how we then relate this in the way that colin and so i'm saying colin is essentially correct now I, colin knows about a lot of these things I don't know if he's brought them up in all of his studies or in any of his studies, but I know he knows them. So he would know these evidences. He just hasn't, from anything, any of the studies I've watched, brought up these particular symbols to tie them to the end. But we can do that. And I, and I know he knows about these things. So, um, so we have the base then is just going to be one tenth of it. And... Um, you know, there's more math that we could do with it, but we don't need to do any of that now. That's not going to be uh, important for our point, but uh, just more just because, you know, we like doing math, at least I do. Um, so, but we're going to see that this, this symbol, and this symbol then, we can say, is tied to the origins of 666, that the measurements of the statue are mystical measurements. They're not just happenstance. Nebuchadnezzar understands 
what he's doing when he gives these measurements. Now, he doesn't know anything about inches, but he does know about the cubits themselves. And so in the cubit, you have the 36 cubits, uh, or well, not 36, the 60 cubits and the six cubits. And that gives you the 360, which gives you this symbol that is a Babylonian symbol connected to the worship of the sky. And they have the various planets that move through the ecliptic and the moon and the sun, and all of these are worshipped. This is the worship that's talked about in Ezekiel that's being condemned, what we would call astrology, right? And we know that this is about astrology. So their astrologers are involved in this whole symbolism that's here. Um, now, 216 can refer to the Sunday law. Yeah, so that's, um, so Angela put a note there. Yes, so, so it's something we know, 36 times 6 is 216. Right, so so we we actually deal we're going to deal with that again on Sunday morning, just in some of the symbols of the on the charts that Stephen gave us in the relationship to other things. But um, so that's uh, so we know that this um, so Jeff's Nashville warning was published on June 21st. So that symbol of June 21st is this symbol of six times six times six. And it's also Samuel Snow's first letter is written on February 16th, which also gives us this same symbol. It's just in a different order. Instead of the, uh, the, the 21st day of the sixth month, his is the 16th day of the second month, right? So, so all of these things are tied together. And that's what God has been showing us through the studies of, of um, Odilio and through the studies of Colin and also Stephen's studies and in our morning studies. We can see that all of these things are coming together, all of these symbols, and they're illustrating something for us to understand. So there, we know the story here of the golden image. Um, now, and we know that Nebuchadnezzar is creating this because he's basically resisting what God is trying to show him about his kingdom, that his kingdom is going to end. And so he creates this statue uh, to show that his kingdom will not end. And we know, of course, the story of the fiery furnace typifies the Sunday law. And it also has the three one combination in it, the three and then the fourth, which is Christ. And, and of course, uh, the symbolism of the music uh, regarding this. So that's, and what is music symbolizing here? Why, why is there music in this story? Well, you have music and worship. Okay, so so we would take it just kind of literally, you know, the celebration movement, right? That type of thing. Or false but worship, I, or, yeah, I mean, false worship, but false worship. Yeah, but I, I think it's something more than that. That's just kind of that to me would be sort of a surface. This, um, because what is music? The melodious sound. Okay, I didn't get your whole statement there, Brian. It's a melodious sound. A melodious sound. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm a musician and I teach music theory. So to me, music is vibrations. But it's it's used to to control people, right? So music is an illustration of something that controls our emotions through vibrations, which is a type of mathematics. And there's a true and a false form or use of music, right? Because music is used in God's worship, but we have this, this false form. And this false form is involved in deception. So we have other things which we, we naturally accept as 
symbols of doctrine, like wine and things that we eat. But music also represents doctrine. Now, remember Zimri in Numbers 25, Baal Peor? You have Zimri and Cosby. So Zimri refers to music, right? Zim Zimri. Right. Zimri? Zimri. So that's one of the persons involved in with, with um, Balaam and the deception there that they use, bringing in these. these um, Do you look at, look at the Hebrew word for that? Uh, Zimri? Yeah. What well, you just type in Zimri and yeah, I mean on your your Yeah, so I'm doing this here. So it's Zimri and that okay. number is two one seven four and two one seven four in the dictionary. It means my music, because that the I at the end is just the possessive of, of of mine. So like um, just means my, right? So Zimmer is music, right? Zimri is my music. So that's what the name Zimri means. So it refers to music. And, and you can see here, if you look at the word music in Daniel chapter 3, that the word there is Zimar, or Zimar, 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 what be more like Zimmer. Anyway. Um, refers to music, right? And and also, um, so what's the the number here? Two one seven zero. What's the significance of that Hebrew number as a number? Does anybody know? Two one seven is July twenty first, mm -hmm. right? And it's also if you uh, multiply. 31 times 7, you get 217 as well. So it refers to the cross, which is midnight. And, and the other uh, word that they have here is 2177, um, which is just the word zen. And, and that's the basis of this. Uh, so it means uh, sort or whatever. So, so anyway, it's it's related why uh, they have this, the word music, what it means, all kinds, all kinds. So this is Zan Zimar is, there, these words are related, 217 and 217, 2178 and 2170. Uh, there, so all manner of music, it's, it's kind of almost a doubling. It's a similar word that is the, becomes connected to it. Okay, so so we have this music involved, and 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 it's symbolizing uh, things connected with the midnight cry, which is, and the midnight cry, of course, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, but it's also about behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and there's this conflict, this great controversy that's being waged as well. So. So we have all these different types of symbols. We could probably spend a lot more time going through this, but I, I don't want to, to spend too much time because we have enough information to tell us that this is about the Sunday law, because we already know that, um, but that this, this statue, the main point that, that Colin is making is that the statue is gold all the way through. Now, if we compare it to the statue in Daniel chapter two, the statue in Daniel chapter 2 represents these kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And so if we compare chapter 3 and chapter 2, what does that tell us about the Sunday law? That, that it's using this image, but it's going to be gold all the way through instead of these different metals. You know, we have uh, begins with Babylon and ends with 
papal right on Babylon. So it just, <laughs> and, and ends up with the gold again, so to speak. Okay. So it ends up with the gold again. So when it comes to the Sunday law, it's now we're seeing that Babylon, this head of gold, has actually this this false worship is going to be historically fulfilled through the Sunday law. That is, this the symbol here that he's creating unwittingly on, on Nebuchadnezzar's part is illustrating the end of the world. He's using that same image that God has given. He's making it all gold, but he's using illustrations that's going to point to the Sunday law. So God uses this as an illustration of the Sunday law and that we can connect this history. Now, we're going to look at, again, so Colin's main arguments come from chapter 3, Daniel chapter 11, and then also from Revelation 17. Okay, so one kingdom has attributes of all the kingdoms of the dream image, uh, Iran says. Yeah, so so it's going to have the arms, the legs, the you know all the feet, everything. But it's going to be Babylon all the way through. Now, the argument here is that we're going to take this Sunday law symbolism and we're going to go over to Revelation chapter 11. And... Colin and I had a bit of an exchange, which um, um, in, in when he was doing the study uh, the second time. And, and in that exchange, I wanted him to explain how he is making uh, a mighty king, a mighty king here. So I'll back up a little bit. So he's going to take what we understand about this. There's going to be... Um, Three kings that are yet going to stand up in Persian. We all know that those kings uh, were taking um, Darius the Mede and Cyrus as representing um, Reagan and Bush the First, right? And then three kings are going to stand up. So Persia is representing the United States. And the three kings that stand up literally are Cambyses, or, or not Cambyses, yeah, Cambyses, False Mertus, and then Darius the Persian. And then the fourth is going to be Xerxes. And we predicted that Trump would be elected based upon this prophecy that we're going to take um, uh, uh, Clinton and Bush the second and um, uh, Obama as representing these... Um, uh, other presidents uh, and these kings. So these kings are representing these presidents. And then we've predicted then that Trump would be the fourth based upon his characteristics, that he would go against the globalists. And, and we were a little bit tentative on that, but there was many people in the movement who were pretty strong on it. And Trump did get elected. And he did stir up all against the realm of Grisha, right? So he went against the globalists. But Colin's argument is that the subject matter here is the United States, which I agree with him. And, and I don't know if he didn't fully understand my question, but when we look at it here in this context, after Trump, what comes next according to Daniel chapter 3? A mighty king shall stand up that shall do, rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So who is this historically? Greece. Greece. And, and particularly Alexander the Great. Right. Specifically Alexander the Great. Right. So when it says a mighty king, we know that it's, it's not the king that has existed before. Because then would it be the mighty king shall stand up. But it doesn't say that in the Hebrew. It's a mighty king. Right. So uh, and when you look at the Hebrew here, just to those of you that read Hebrew, you're just going to see the word Melech. It doesn't have a he in front of it. It doesn't say the mighty king. But in Daniel chapter 11, when we go to verse um, 
So I'll go back to the English here so you can see that. So it's gonna it's gonna give us a talks about uh, the king shall do according to his will, and that's Daniel eleven verse thirty six, right? And we know that the historically this argument is Uriah Smith says, well, if it said a king, then it would be introducing a new power, and so he says that this king here is is uh, it's going to be France, right? Specifically. Um, Napoleon, right? So this is going to be France that's in, introduced this this atheistic power that's going to be part of Daniel 11 verse 40. So so he he has this change from uh, the idea that this is from James White's understanding is that this is still a papacy. But Uriah Smith goes back to an earlier view that the pioneers had and argues that this is then France. And we went through that in our early, early studies dealing with um, uh, examining the foundation. So we, we, we went through and worked through why they saw things the way they saw them. And they making the same, we're making the same mistake that they made. But anyway, the point here is that this is the king. So do you have something to say, William? Your mic's on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't that Turkey instead of France? No, France is the king. Okay. So, so then they're going to have the king of the south is Turkey, or, or the king of the south is Egypt and the king of the north is Turkey. So instead of having this continue to be the papacy, he says that a new power is introduced, which is France, right? But he says if it said a king, right, but it doesn't say a king. If you look here at this verse, um, it's going to say Hamelech. That word 4428 is Malik and it has a ha. Ha is the. So it says the king. So it's referring to a king that they already talked about, which is the king of the north, not a new power being introduced. So we kind of had almost the reverse argument here uh, between Colin and I, because I was saying, well, since it says a mighty king and it doesn't say the king, but he is, Colin's kind of arguing that it, it's the king, the mighty king, that's going to stand up. Because it's going to be the one that was uh, typifying Trump, Xerxes. But we know that that's not what happens historically. So we have this little bit of an exchange and then, you know, basically people weren't happy about my questioning a few people about me questioning Colin to try to explain this. But this was an important point. Now, he was just saying, and, and the exchange that we had went, uh, I, I actually have it here. So, um, so what was said um, was this. Uh, and I'm just going to put this here in. So this is the transcript. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat here. So you can see it, but I'll read it. Okay, so Colin said, here's the subject matter. Here is Persia, right? And then Theodore, that's me, says, no, but the subject matter here is Greece. So we're talking about verse 3. Greece, when you talk about a mighty king that shall stand up. And Colin says, I'm saying the subject matter here is still Persia. And I say, uh, based on what? And he says, based on the Bible. And I say, based on what in the Bible? And he says, the subject matter. And then I say, but no, because the Bible's clear. The next one is, Alexand is Alexander. He's not Persia. Right? So that's what's said, right? So that, and if anybody remembers that, that's that's the exact transcript uh, with a couple of spelling error corrections uh, that I put in. But otherwise, and, and I put, of course, who's speaking, so people could tell who's speaking there. So we can see the problem here. Now, when he says the subject matter, what does he mean? What is his argument? Because I think I know what he means. He just never really explained it. He could have had an argument for it, but he didn't present that argument. 
So why is he arguing that the subject matter is still Persia when we're talking about Greece? Because it's still gold. Okay, right. So he's going back to that image and saying, well, it's still gold. But does Babylon move through all of these kingdoms? Yeah, paganism moves through all, all the kingdoms. Right. So, so we know that Babylon works through all of these kingdoms. But we know that Persia here particularly represents the United States. And we've taken these kings and we've reached them up to Trump. But now we say a mighty king shall stand up. We know that historically that's Greece. That's going to be Alexander. And that Trump has gone against Greece and he's lost. That is, Xerxes went against Greece. That's Esther chapter 1. That's why he's having that uh, 180 plus seven days, these, this feast going from the spring of Kittu festival to the fall of Kittu festival. It's the same number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And that's actually where he's starting because it's going to start on the first day of the first month. And, and, and so, so we know that we can take that, the symbols there from Xerxes and there's going to be a relationship to the Sunday law. And we're going to see, and, and we studied the book of Esther and we came to some conclusions about it. So uh, we're going to go through some of that as we get through this study, because we need to understand the Sunday law. And so we're going to look at the book of Esther in relation to the Sunday law and try to understand it. Um, so the mighty king that stands up or a mighty king that stands up is not the mighty king. So it can't be from the Bible, it can't be Xerxes. It has to be Alexander. And that's how it's understood. But if the image is all gold, you can say, well, the image is all Persia. But remember, the image represents Babylon. It doesn't represent Persia. The United States is Persia. But is United States, is Persia, the United States, Conquered by Greece. Yeah, globalists. So do the globalists conquer the United States? Yes, yes. And did that happen in the reign of Trump? Did Trump lose to the globalists during the time that he was king? Not during the time, no. Well, yeah, during the time, because January 6th, was he still king? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. January yeah. 6, 2021, Trump was still king, but he loses to the globalists. Right. And then a mighty king shall stand up, it says. Now, in this case, we're not going to say that it's a person. We're not going to say that Biden is a mighty king because he isn't. Now, can we argue, though? that Alexander is representing not just a person, but a type of government. Yes. Okay. And that government is what has controlled the United States since January 6, 2021. And we should recognize it, that Trump is the last president of the United States. He doesn't need to be reelected in order to be the last president of the United States. Because symbolically, in the way the Bible prophecy is understood, when a kingdom is conquered, does it still exist as far as, far as its relationship to that prophecy? Once, once Greece, once Greece uh, comes into play, so they're not going to go from Xerxes and go through all the different Persian kings, are they? until you get to Alexander, right? Until you get to Greece rising up and all that. They're just gonna jump right to Alexander. So they, you don't even have Artaxerxes in here, right? In this context, yeah. right? So it's just gonna jump because, because Xerxes loses to Greece, then a mighty king will stand up. So Trump has lost to Greece, 
But we know that when, when Xerxes loses to Greece, does a mighty king stand up immediately? Does Alexander stand up when, when Xerxes loses to the, to the Greeks? It, it doesn't happen then, does it? No, it doesn't. Okay, so this mighty king is still future, even though they've conquered Persia. Can we agree with that? Yes, I can see that. Yeah, so we shouldn't be looking for Biden to be the mighty king. Now, or, or even Trump. So, so one of the things that's odd about Colin's interpretation, from my perspective, so I'm just telling you what I understand, is he ignores Biden completely, right? So he just says, we have Trump here and we have Trump here. And this is the United States all the way through. We all agree that the United States is conquered by the globalists at some point. And that if we're going to look at the time in which it occurs, it's going to occur in the time of Trump because it occurs in the time of Xerxes. But you don't have a mighty king stand up immediately. Alexander is going to be a lot later, but we know that prophetically that's the next thing. And, and when that happens, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. So can we, we, we know that Xerxes, that Trump lost to the globalists, to Greece. But can we agree that a mighty king has not yet stood up? Uh, yeah, from what we see, yeah. Okay. And that the standing up of the mighty king is going to symbolize, or, or is it? Is it going to symbolize the Sunday law? Why would it symbolize the Sunday law? Okay, so the question is, because we know that the globalists, do the globalists bring in the Sunday law? In, in our understanding. So we're just thinking here. Well, they paved the way for Sunday to come in. Okay, so, so if we look back at how we understood things in the 1990s as Seventh-day Adventists, um, we would say, well, the ones who are going to bring in the Sunday law is the evangelicals in the United States, right? And, and, and I'm struggling with this whole thing of looking at what's happening now and trying to say, where are we in this stream of prophecy? So, so we know that the globalists are going to be involved. Now, the kingdom shall be broken. and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. So we know that this has to do with its universal aspect. And, and we, haven't, we haven't really spent time going through Daniel chapter 11 after we had had all of this history unfold to fully understand this. But we would have to say that there's something going on here that still is going to be future and that it's going to lead to the Sunday law. but the globalists standing up are connected to the Sunday law, but they're not the ones who bring in the Sunday law. Because if we go through Daniel chapter 11, we're going to see all of this prophecy that was fulfilled historically, and it's going to be repeated in our time, right? And that we really get the Sunday law when we get to Daniel 11, verse 41, correct? All right, agreed. Okay, so I, I don't, I haven't spent time studying all this through to see how our understanding of Daniel 11 is affected as we go through this history again. But when we understood it in the past, we didn't understand that this is the Sunday law. But if Collins arguing that Trump is this a mighty king, but he's the mighty king, and that he's going to bring in the Sunday law, we can see that that doesn't really line up with how we understand Daniel chapter 11 
as far as where the Sunday law is concerned. Now we can say that the beginning of Daniel chapter 11 is going to repeat uh, what's in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. So, so we can say that there is some connection to the Sunday law, but it's not as it's not as detailed. That is, his kingdom is going to be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. We don't really know what that means. We haven't interpreted that completely when it comes to how we understand what's going to happen in the future. And, and it may be that we need to look at re-examine Daniel chapter 11, which we're not going to do tonight. But so, so this is Colin's argument, though, right? His argument is that Trump is going to be the mighty king that stands up. Okay, now his next line of argument is Revelation 17. Now, we spent a lot of time looking at the beasts and the pioneer understanding of the heads and the ten horns. Um, and, and we're going to come back over these things. So, so I'm just kind of trying to lay out his basic argument here. Now, so I would argue that he's correct about Daniel chapter 3. And I would argue that we are correct about Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, except when it comes to the idea that it needs to be a person uh, who is going to be the one that's represented by a mighty king shall stand up. I mean, it may be a person, but it's not going to be one of the kings of Persia, I guess, is the way that I would put it. That is, it can't be referring to an American president. Because if Persia represents the United States, Greece represents a power that conquers the United States. It can't represent the United States. But now what, he, what, what Colin's going to do is he's going to go to Revelation 17. And, and we did spend a lot of time on this, but I want to try to go through this um, and bring out the main points. How we understood this, um, uh, so he's carried away, so let's start with verse 3. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now we know there's similarities to this beast, to the, to the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13. And also uh, to the great red dragon that we see in Revelation chapter 12. But we know it's not the same beast. And, and what were the differences that we brought out about this beast in Revelation 17 to show that it's not the same beast in Revelation 13? They have similar characteristics, but what are the differences? Well, it's both scarlet, but one's, one's a dragon and one's a beast. Okay, so one's a dragon, one's a beast. And we know that that dragon in chapter 12 Reptile. is a dragon, right? In chapter 13, it's what we call the composite beast. So that beast is going to have, uh, you know, um, the different characteristics of Babylon. It has a mouth of a lion. It has um, feet of a bear. It, it looks like a leopard, right? Spots like a leopard, right? And then it's going to, um, uh, uh, have these seven heads and 10 horns, right? So it's going to have seven heads and 10 horns, but the horns are going to have crowns upon them, right? In chapter 13, the other beast in chapter 12 has, has crowns on its heads. There's seven crowns on the heads, but then there's going to be these crowns on the horns. Now, how did the pioneers understand these crowns and what they represented in chapter 12 and 13? Does anybody remember well, how the pioneers they, understood they the, the Roman, Roman governments. Okay, so the seven forms of Roman government. Right? Yes. yes. You know, there's the, the kingly period, the monarch, monarchical period yeah. 
right? There's the the Republican period, and then there's times they had December this December or whatever they had um, ten rulers. Uh, they would also have what they call dictators. A dictator would uh, rule in a time when there was an emergency, so it would cut through all the red tape, but it would always be for a specified period of time. And then there would uh, be also um, the triumvirates. So that's three rulers. So they tried these different forms of government. And then in 27 BC, they're going to make um, Augustus the first emperor and they're going to start the imperial Rome. And then finally, you're going to have um, the papal Roman government. That's going to be the seventh head. And so these heads are the different forms of government. But the horns, they, um, and there's different interpretations of the horns specifically, but they're going to represent uh, the divisions of Rome. And in chapter 13, you're going to then see that the heads don't have crowns, but the horns do. And so that's going to be the period of the papacy, right? So when we look on the 1843 chart and we see this um, dragon with seven heads, or not the dragon, the, uh, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, um, well, they have the great red dragon, and then they have papal Rome. And it's going to have uh, sort of from Daniel's prophecies more than anything. But, but you're going to have the idea that there's this beast, the beasts of Daniel, and they're going to be represented symbolically. Yeah, they have it there, papal Rome. Seven heads and ten horns with the crowns upon their horns. They have that. And I think they have like flags or something, looks like, on the 1843 chart. So, so, they, so they understand the connection to the prophecies of Daniel. And... Um, when they deal with papal Rome, they see that papal Rome has this divided nature, the, the ten toes, the ten horns. And so it's going to be the period of the papacy. And, and it's going to be near the end of that period. Right. And, and the pioneers understood that when they look at these visions, that the visions here are going to be looking in the future. Revelation 17 is not talking about John's day. It's talking about the perspective in 1798. And then you're going to, or Revelation 13. And in Revelation 17, again, it's going to be at the end of the world. And this, these, uh, what we're seeing in Revelation 17 here is that there's seven heads and ten horns. But it says about um, that, um, uh, where is it here? Yeah, the ten horns which thou sawest, that's verse 12, are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, when it says that they, are, that they have uh, not received power yet, that would be from the perspective of 97 AD when John received the vision. So the pioneers understood that when you have the vision, the vision can be in the future, but the explanation that's given to John is given to him from his personal perspective of the time that he's in. That is, the ten horns are ten kings. They're going to be ten kings that receive a kingdom during the papal period, right? That's, this is the way the pioneers understood it. And so that's why they have crowns in Revelation 13. But here in Revelation 17, they don't have crowns. And, but they're going to still be those 10 kings symbolically. But they have in 97 AD. They don't have a kingdom yet. But we can see in Revelation 13 they did. Right? Do we agree with that? I can see that. Okay. So, so this is a problem. Now, what we have done, this is, we went back and we studied the pioneers. And we can see that their, their study makes sense. That is, it's not, it still fits even today. 
Now we have a different interpretation of Revelation 17. That is, we're going to look at these, these seven heads as being Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan and pale, the United States and the United Nations, and that these 10 horns are going to represent the United Nations that haven't received a kingdom yet. And that's how we've understood it in this movement. Now, Colin put out a statement. Well, I don't think it was his statement because he seemed to be quoting somebody, but he, it was sent to me. And that anybody who rejects this view of Revelation 17 is basically uh, rejecting the foundation of this message. Right? So maybe that's true. Yeah. So maybe he's correct and I'm wrong. But my view is that the foundation of this message goes back even earlier. And that this view that we have of Revelation 17 is a very modern view. And, but there is some validity to it. That is, I think that these are compatible. But they're compatible when we understand what principle that this movement has been founded on. How do we look at prophecy when it comes to our time? Do we look to prophecies as being fulfilled specifically in our time, but having nothing to do with the past? There are some prophecies like that, of course. But what, how do we generally understand prophecy? What do we do when we look at prophecy? Well, the past explains the, explains the future. Right. So we can look back at how the pioneers understood this, and we can see that the fulfillment of these prophecies are correct, but that we can make an application to our time. And, and that's really what we have been doing in this movement with Revelation 17. That is, we've been understanding it as a sort of as a repeat of history, which is not what the prophecy is originally talking about. That is, it's talking about a prophecy that's, that's going to go to the end of time, but that is, is founded upon things that have already happened in the past. And so when we make this application, we sh it's not an either or situation. We can see that God led in this movement in this understanding about what's going to happen in the future in connection with the Sunday law, because it's consistent with Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It's consistent with what Ellen White says in the Great Controversy. And yet, we can also see that the pioneers' understanding of these verses is consistent with this message, that they're not a contradiction, that they're complementary. And that's what we have to examine, right? That's what we're trying to look at in the next few weeks, that we're going to delve into this in more detail. Um, now, we've been really involved in the morning studies in all kinds of light that God has been giving us. And I believe that that light is shedding light on this issue here, dealing with Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and its connection to Daniel 11, and verse 1 to 3, and Daniel chapter 3. Because we've had all these symbols dealing with the Sunday law. We've had this understanding, too, which we looked at. Um, over the last couple of studies, dealing with 666, right? And we can see that 666 is connected uh, to the past in various ways. And we can see that also in Daniel chapter 3, that this connects us to Babylon. Now, uh, where Colin really focuses is on this uh, riddle, Here's the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So one of the things about this beast is the woman sitting on this beast is the papacy, as we know, right? This is a church. And in Revelation 13, we don't have a woman sitting on the beast. But we see that one of the heads is the papal government. So when we go to Revelation 17, and we look at these, these uh, 
this riddle, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Is it valid to place these kings as the seven American presidents that we already understand? That is, we're taking something that the pioneers used in Revelation 13, and they go to Revelation 17, and John is seeing the beast at the end of the world, not the one in 1798, but the one that's going to become the beast at the end of the world, that the woman's going to ride, these governments of the world, the globalists, right? She's going to be riding this beast. She's going to be committing fornication with the governments of the world, right? With this beast. Right. Okay, so so that's something we, we understand, that this woman is riding this beast. Now, the problem that I've always had, maybe other people have had this problem as well, but it's like if one of the heads is the papacy, how can the woman be riding the beast? Now, we could say maybe the papal form of government that the pioneers are talking about would be one of the heads. But could we argue here that, that there's something more than what the pioneers saw? The papacy is, uh, you know, not just a power, but it's a political power, too. Yeah, it's a political power, too. But the woman here, so, so we know, we could have one of the heads being the political power of the papacy. Um, but the political power of the papacy and the army of the papacy is the United States. It uses the kingdoms of the world. So here the woman is riding this, this beast. I have no problem with one of the seven heads, the last head, representing in chapter three, representing the papacy as the pioneers understood it. And, and it's going to be the one that receives the deadly wound. What we have done is we've made an, an assumption that as we look at Revelation chapter 13, and we assume that the seven heads represent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, and Papal, United States, and the UN. That is, we, in a sense, confound these two beasts. We, we, we just, we think they're the same beast, but they're not. They can't be. The heads can't really be the same heads. And, and I'm not saying I have the answer to this. This is what we're going to, to delve into in trying to understand it and see if following Miller's rules, uh, we can see this clearly. So I'm just giving the summation of the problem. Now, so we have this woman riding this beast. And we know, though, that John, when he's being explained to him what this vision was that he was in, what it means that it's going to be explained to him in 97 AD. He's not going to be or have the explanation given to him in our time. And we can see that when we look at, at, at what happens in chapter 13 and 12 and so on, that, that, that John is in his time receiving a vision in the future. So, I don't think we've been thorough enough in our understanding and in comparison of the different beasts in this movement, right? So I don't think that we have been, we've been clear that we end up with these contradictions that don't make sense, but we just ignore them because that's what human brains do, right? We try to make what makes sense, but there's all kinds of details that uh, create these contradictions that mean that we, we don't fully understand these visions. So it doesn't make sense to me, just in, in this straightforward way here, to take Colin's argument about the riddle and to say that, that these, um, these seven kings are going to re represent the presidents of the United States and that the eighth has to be one of these seven kings. I believe that they do represent the presidents of the United States. In, in a certain sense, only in a repeat of history, though. So now, 
if we look at Revelation 17.10, the way the pioneers understood it, there are seven kings. These, these, these are the forms of Roman government. Five are fallen, and one is. The one is, is imperial Rome, and the other is not yet come, papal Rome. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And a short space doesn't mean a short amount of time. It means a portion of something else. So this short space is the 1260 years. Prophetically, it's represented by a short space. It means it's a very specific point, point, period of time that's a portion of something else. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now this is where Joseph Bates says the beast that was and is not, that this is referring to the image to the beast. That is, it's going to be the image to the beast that is created by the United States, which is this lamb with the two horns. And so that this image to the beast is the eighth. It's of the seven, saying it's one of those forms of government, which in this case would be republicanism. And it goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. So in the time, 97 AD, they had received no kingdom but receive powers as kings one hour with the beast. So that's, again, that 1260 years. That's the period of that is a short space. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Now we can see that this is going to be um, bringing us to the end of the world as well, right? So we're going to see the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now, this can refer to 1798. Correct? <clears throat> yeah, sure, good. Okay, right. But it also can refer to the end of the world. So that is, we can look at this history and just like Ellen White says about Daniel chapter 11, the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. Can we not say the same thing about Revelation 17? If Daniel and Revelation are one book, then we would have to be saying that. Yes. And, and so what we need to do is we need to spend time examining these things in much more detail than we have in the past. Um, uh, so Dwight, you've got some glasses there. Is that helping you see better? Nope. No. <laughs> Honestly really not. Help? What's that? Honestly, it doesn't. It doesn't, eh? Okay. Because, no. you know, one of the things is, you know, we're going to have to get some notes to go through these verses as we've been doing in our studies in the morning studies with the book of Joshua, etc. Yeah. Looking at these chapters, breaking them down and taking time to understand them, comparing scripture with scripture, using the guidance of the footnotes that the translators of the of the Probably. what's 1769? Probably I mean, could put them on a line or something like that. Yeah, and, and put things on a line. Yeah. One of the things one of the things that I, I'm going to to bring out for all of us to consider this last week i was having a conversation with a friend a brother that's been in the movement okay but he had he had quite an quite an interesting attitude and i've run into this attitude before because i expressed the attitude okay years ago when I was when I was invited to a Bible study up in Newport, Washington, mm -hmm. I came to this study, and the one the party that was giving the study was Bill Campbell, yeah. and he had the two charts that are behind me up 
in front of the church. Mm -hmm. Now, he went through the study. He was going through it point by point. After the study, I walked up to him and I said, okay, I get it. I mean, you're, you know, you're going all the way back to 1844 and before, but why do we, why do we need to do that when it's the third angel's message that we are supposed to be proclaiming? Mm -hmm. And his answer to me was very specific. How can you give the first, how can you give the third angel's message when you don't understand what the first two angels' messages are all about? Right. Now, this brother came to me and made the comment, we already know that the message that we are to be giving is what we're finding in Revelation 14. Yeah. Why are you wasting all this time going back through what you find in Joshua, in Judges, and all the rest of this? Why are you worrying so much about the minor prophets? Mm -hmm. Now, my comment to him was very simple. Uh, in this in this movement, do you accept Ellen White as a prophet? He said, well, yeah, kind of. I, I, I really do. I do accept that she's a prophet. Okay. So did with what she had to say, with the admonitions that she gave, are they for our time? Well, yeah, I, I'd kind of have to agree that they are. Now, in our situation here, we have talked because we are examining the Millerite time frame for evidences of what we are to be doing at this point. There mm -hmm. are others that I've spoken with that are beginning to understand that these studies, these Friday night studies, these studies during the week, are examining points that should have been being examined by the entire movement for the last many years. Yes. Now, the point that I asked my brother, if Ellen White is a prophet, and if what she has stated is for our time, there's a passage out of Southern Watchmen that's very specific, that the books of these minor prophets are to be studied in conjunction with the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And he goes, but what does that have to do with, with revelation? I said, there's also a point, and Mrs. White is very clear, that revelation and Daniel are as one book. So if the minor prophets are to be studied in conjunction with the book of Daniel, then the minor prophets are also to be studied in conjunction with the book of Revelation. Yeah, well, the whole Bible is all one, really. <clears throat> we agree. Yeah, I mean, now, dealing with this point, I mean, we have people in this movement um, who don't believe that we're doing the right thing in, in the way that we're studying, that we should be just giving the third angel's message, right? So, so we have that problem still existing in the movement now. Exactly. And, but we can see that all of the light that God has been giving us in our, in our daily studies, and, and even what, what's been given to Odilio and to Stephen and, and to you, all these things are fitting together, illustrating that, that this movement is being led by God and that the things that he showed us are not error, that we just don't fully understand the message. Now, he's also leading us to the upper room so we can see, and, and I thought that's one of the things about Adilio's study, he's dealing with the upper room. Well, the upper room isn't just about uh, Christ coming there. Um, it's also the place in where they come together. But we still, we see that we need that. And, and, and Odilio uses his two studies too, which are, is important, his, his Nero study and his July 18 and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic study. Uh, the period of time between that, it's symbolism by taking, well, it's actually the dates 
that he has those two studies. If you multiply them together, you get 1872. So, so we can see that what Adilio has been given is part of this puzzle, part of this picture. What Collins has been given is part of this picture. And, and all these different studies are, are, God is trying to show us something. But in order for us to understand them, we have individual study that's important. But we also have group study that's important. And we have to come together in that upper room experience for us to understand this message. If we, if this movement fractures, I don't see how it can fulfill its commission. Now, of course, you know, this is me looking at it from a human point of view, but I also see from a prophetic point of view, if the disciples had not come together in the upper room, they wouldn't have had the Holy Spirit poured out upon them on the day of Pentecost, when Christ began his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So, so, we, so we can see, we, we can't neglect any of this light, but we do need to understand it. You know, and I wish I could just go through it and just give you all the answers, but I think that we have to go through the process together. Agreed. And, and that's not an easy thing to do. You know, when, when people have minds that think alike, it's easier, but we have many minds in this movement that have different experiences and think differently. And in order for us to then work together, it would require a, a true conversion experience. That's what God is calling us to. And to make, to go, enter into covenant with him. And, you know, we, we can see this in, in all of the things that we've been studying. It becomes very, very clear, the chronology, the stories, the symbolism, all these things have been given to us, and yet few in the movement understand them. Now, um, on Thursday, my pastor from Warburg came over. Um, he's a very nice man. And uh, I explained to him Daniel, or not Daniel, Ezra 7 to 10, so the beginning of the 2300 days, and uh, the way Marx and Millerite history dealing with the first day of the first month all the way to the 10th day of the seventh month, midnight in the midnight cry, and the symbols there. And, um, and uh, one other thing, which I can't remember what it was, but um, anyway, in, in presenting these things to him, he says, well, they're interesting. I'm interested in them. But from his perspective, and I've had other pastors tell me this, and I've struggled with it myself, how does this help? in evangelism like how are we going to take this very uh dense message this very involved message of so many things that we're learning how are we going to take these and present them to others and when even in our movement many people don't want to look at these things not everybody's head can hold numbers now after the pastor had left, I went to teach, and then I had one of my guitar students. Um, I shared with her some of the things we're learning. She's a Christian, and she wants to study the Bible with Heidi and I now, the book of Daniel. That's what she wanted to study. I said, what do you want to study? She said, well, the book of Daniel. So do you have any studies on the book of Daniel? That's what I want to study, so we're going to study together. And, and I started thinking about it. Um, so I've, I've already told some people this illustration, but, you know, as teaching music theory, I understand the music theory on a level that very few people do, even people who are musicians and teach music theory. But when I present music theory, what I'm presenting, because I have a great knowledge of music theory, I can fashion my presentations to suit the individual that I'm teaching. That is, I don't have a rote message method of presenting music theory. Every person is different. Every student I work with is different. I can assess how much knowledge they have, and as I give them information, I can see what things they understand and what things they don't. Um, but if I didn't have a great knowledge of music theory, I couldn't do that. I would just have to have some presentation on how you understand music theory. I'd have to go through step by step 
the way that I learned it and memorize it, right? That's the way that most people learn things like this. And of course, they don't understand them. And they don't remember them because they don't really use them. But it's the same with truth. The reason that we are going in depth is because we are needing to become teachers. And not everybody's going to go to the depth that I do when it comes to chronology and numbers. I'm not expecting people to. But we do need to be open to understand these things. The other thing is, you know, Heidi, when I met her nine years ago, uh, she was very scared of numbers and um, couldn't keep numbers in her head, uh, couldn't do math. She had to do special when she did math in high school. She had to have a special tutor. It just barely passed math. But Heidi understands these things now because one is God's healing her mind, but also an openness to understand truth can allow us to see things that our nature doesn't want us to see. Correct? Agreed. So, so I think that the world out there, when I present chronology to people who aren't Adventists, they're very open and they're convinced and they can see that it's true. But if you try to present this to an Adventist, the pastor's correct. Adventists aren't going to be interested. But it's not because, and, and it's all in God's word, right? So, but many people don't want to have anything to do with 99% of God's word. Right? They want they want the stories on the surface. They want devotional studies. Uh, they want to know about Jesus and his goodness and his love. That's well, nothing not, wrong with that. They're not treasure hunters. Well, they're not treasure hunters because they don't realize that there's a pearl of great price. They don't realize there's a field with a treasure in it. They're not digging for truth. They're satisfied with on, what they have. They're laid to see it. Yeah. They just want to look on top of the ground. They don't want to get right. the shovel and dig. Yeah. But I believe that there are some Adventists who are open to these things. The ones who are seeking truth will receive what we present. It's not going to be as detailed as all of this stuff that we're doing. But because we can become teachers, we have to understand the basis. And we have to use the Holy Spirit's leading when we present to a an individual. So when I present to a person, maybe there's 99% of what I could present to them wouldn't strike them, but God can lead me to present the very specific things that they need to see that God's word is true. And that as they study together, they can see how everything fits, even if they don't say as much detail as God has shown us, because I can't even remember everything that we've studied. So, so we know we can't expect others, but if somebody's not willing to examine the truth, then that's the real danger. And, and how this is going to happen, how, because I believe that we need to have more people here in these Friday night studies to examine these things or to have other studies that are more convenient for people to study these things that we can study them together. You've been doing them for two years now, close to two years. Yeah. You've been doing the, the, the studies for two years. We started with three hours a day uh, back in uh, April of uh, 2020. Chronology Ezra, I think, was the first one you did. Yeah, so we did all these things, but very few people – in this movement are really interested in those things. I mean, there are people that are, but most people aren't. And, you know, and I have this burden, right, to share things because I believe that these are powerful truths that we need to understand. They're powerful to me. Um, but in order for us to come together to study these things, that's going to require God working in this movement to bring us together. And I believe that he is bringing us together. He's bringing us through an experience that's bringing us to the upper room. That that is our destiny. That's our goal. That's where we're going to end up. 
Because if we don't end up there, we're just going to end up in the world. We end up with the settling and selling of the truth, selling yeah. into the truth. Well, one is people are going to make predictions that aren't going to come true. And when those predictions aren't fulfilled, many people's faith is going to again be weakened. Right? And we saw this when we studied early writing 74. What was happening there is illustrating what's happening in this movement right now. So that's where we're at. And, and you know, so I hope that this study here, just outlining Collins' basic argument, that we can see that when we delve into it, that there's going to be much of what he's saying that is valid, but that the arguments that he's making are are misplaced, that is, he's right in his general approach, but he's wrong in some of the specific applications of that approach. And that's because we haven't examined this thing completely. We've examined it partly. So again, we're going to be studying into this, but to study into Colin's study means that we have to study other things again. We're going to have to study Xerxes himself. We're going to look at that. And then we're going to have to study Daniel chapter 11. I mean, ultimately, this study is going to probably have to come down to understanding Daniel chapter 11 more deeply than we do and correcting any misunderstandings that we have in it. But, you know, I personally believe Trump's not going to become president again because of prophecy, not because of my personal feelings. Um, and I believe that we're making a mistake when we make that claim because I think that we're missing things. And now not some people aren't going to like that, but if it's true that Trump's going to be president, we need to study that together. Everybody has to study it and understand it together as a movement. It's not going to help us to push away people who don't agree with us. That's, that's not going to help this movement at all because we'll be doing what we've always done. Yeah. There's a, but there's, there's a different point here, Theodore. Yeah. <clears throat> you were, you were willing to stand up with Colin to want to examine what he was saying. Mm -hmm. You were not opposing what he was saying. You were asking him to examine his premise and present it in such a way so that more people could either look at this to say, I agree with you, or look at it to say, I don't agree. Right. Yeah, because definitely I don't in any way is attacking, because I think that what he's saying is essentially correct, his basic argument. Okay, but you, in, in the last few Friday night studies, you've been, yeah. you've been very clear, especially the ones where we've been examining what Colin has had to say. Yeah. Now, the problem that occurred, and I'm the one saying this, you are not. Mm -hmm. Those that were afraid to examine this wished to have a surface understanding only and did not choose to take a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. Because if they took the deeper dive, they would have to examine for themselves exactly what was being said to either come back and say, yes, I can agree with you, or, hey, I might have a point that you haven't considered. Right. Yeah, and, th and this is the same situation with the church. So with the 2520, yes. for instance. So if, if the church was unwilling to even look at what we had to say and, and we were just shut out, uh, we can't do the same thing to others. But I'm saying, you know, it's easy to look at other people and say that they should have done something different. But that's not the person that we can control, right? So we believe that God is still, in spite of the fact that there are people resistant to looking at some of these things, that God's going to bring this movement together 
to an upper room experience. Not doesn't mean every single person, but but this movement has to come together. It it it, it can't continue to fracture. That's my belief. Well, could be, yeah. I'll I'll put it I'll put it in another set of terms. Yeah. Several months ago, I presented a study on the different Marys, specifically with Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. Mary of Bethany. Yeah. Now, a good friend of mine, a brother in the movement, mm -hmm. when I originally shared with him what I was looking at on this with Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. he got very angry with me. He told me, I don't want to see this. I don't want to hear it. You don't even bother sending these, these kind of things to me. I've looked at this study in many different ways. I have found that Doug Batchelor believes as I do, and that's good enough for me. I don't have to look any further. Yeah. Now, in the church, there are many that have looked at the ministry that Elder Jeff had had, mm -hmm. and they've called him all sorts of different names. Mm -hmm. All of them were parties that from Adventist history have become pariahs to the world. And they are pariahs to the church because the church began to see them as taking not members so much, but money away from the church. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that some of these, some of these other smaller ministries are being visited by pastors from the church. And the church, the, the pastors make it very clear. You want to be separate, you want to still preach the Advent message, fine. As long as you don't touch tithe money and you turn that over to the church, we have no problem with you. And that kind of is, is kind of a surprise to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I mean, yep. Rosanna? I think we're going to be studying, um, um, taking these numbers to other people. Well, the thing that is. I, I can't even hold them. Okay. So everybody's going to be different. So you may not be the numbers specifically, but the truths that we are understanding can be presented, right? Now, yeah, I, I understand people are not going to have a mind that's going to hold all these numbers, but there are studies that we can do. For instance, the study that I presented um, to the pastor, Ezra 7 to 10, it's very simple to do from the Bible because it gives us the dates, and it gives us the periods of three days, and you don't need to know anything about calendars and how they work. You can use it, um, uh, you know, just as, as the spans of time, and you can see the two chiasms, Pentecost and um, the Day of Atonement. And, and it can be done in a very simple way, just leading somebody through the scriptures, drawing it on a line. And, and that's the way that I would, that I find is powerful, is when I draw these things for people. So I may not be able to memorize everything, but I can show people the lines. I can show them the crucifixion of Christ. And, and you can do the math right there, even if you can't remember all the numbers. You can do the basic math, right? You can use a calculator if you need to. Now, one of the reasons I can remember these things as well as I do, one is I, I think about them all the time. So that definitely helps. I present them all the time. Um, but I do have a natural ability to remember numbers. But Heidi cannot um, do math or remember numbers, except that she can with this message. 
Now, she sees this a lot more than most people, and I go through these things with her again and again. But somebody who's as handicapped as she is with numbers can still see them and understand them and can know how to present them to people in a way that's different than I present them. But people can see them because she's presented these truths to others in a way that she can do that. Now, each of us is different, but God also leads us to people who can receive truth um, from us. That is, if we're open to God's Holy Spirit and to his leading, he will lead us to people who are open to truth. And God might lead me to a different person than he would lead you to. Because if he led me to that person that he leads you to, that person wouldn't receive anything. But if you present it, you maybe can make that connection. You can present it in a way that I couldn't. Right? Does that make sense, Rosanna? Yes, I can't see me presenting anything, but anyway, uh, and especially with numbers, but I've got something here I'd like to read. Okay. It says, God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that mm -hmm. he is taking the reins into his own hands. Mm -hmm. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. Mm -hmm. To me, simple is not all these numbers. <laughs> so okay. I think simple, I think he's going to show us something that's going to be so simple. Okay. And he's doing it maybe already to people. Well, so for instance, I, I mean, that's a quote that's guided me for now for nearly, nearly 40 years. Right. So, so I understand that quote. Now, simple um, the way that I understand this quote is the church has all this human machinery, right? Organizational structure, uh, planned programs with, with um, you know, five days to stop smoking or whatever it is. Um, all these different things that they do that they think they're going to reach the world. But the simple means that God uses, these include... Um, simple remedies and therapies, right? Personal labor, like when I share with my guitar students something that I've learned. That that's not that's what she means by simple means. Not so much that it has to be simple ideas, right? Because if that's true, then Ellen White isn't following her own counsel. Or even principles of people. Yeah. Because when she writes things like The Great Controversy, many people can think that that's rather complex. Uh, you know, you may have a problem with numbers. Some people have a problem with history. Or even just basic prophecy in general, right? Uh, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, things that we believe as, as Adventists. That, and uh, Jeff is here reminding us that God can also bring these things to our remembrance. But... I've never made the argument that people need to understand everything in its absolute depth the way that I do when it comes to chronology. And I don't know if I understand everything even. But in, in order to be uh, used by God to minister to people. Uh, sometimes the ministry that we do to people is, is very simple in how we talk to them and treat them. Um, but we have to be willing to share truths. And once you start sharing truths with people, you will find that God will give you a way to present. Um, and I think that line upon line is actually a really simple way to present. When you do draw um, the week of Christ, the crucifixion, or you draw the 70 weeks out, or the 2300 days, people can see it. If you can compare the two 1260s uh, with... Uh, the week of Christ. People can see it. And and that's the thing that's been given to this movement, this line upon line. Um, and that has helped me being able to present to other people that they can see it. Because I can visualize everything in my head, but most people can't. So, um, so it, you, we need to have this visual for people. 
But it, it's not just about, you know, all these things that God is giving us. Mostly, we would say that they're a message to this movement. Even if we can't remember everything, we, we should be able to understand it on some level to see that it's not happenstance. And it takes time, you know, it takes time and study and prayer and God uh, speaking to us through his Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds. But um, I understand not everybody can do math. And, it's, and especially to keep it in their mind, right, all these numbers and dates. So, but these truths, what's memory. that? Yeah, and For some people have memory. Right. So, so I know it's it's just the memory the, the of trying to remember things. Not everybody can remember everything, but you can understand it. And you should be able to present to others. You'll find that when you present to others, God will bring them to remembrance. It's quite amazing what God will say through us when we allow his Holy Spirit to speak through us. God can heal our minds, and he can also uh, give us uh, a message that we would never have ever thought of before. And that's happened to me many times. So, yeah, Dwight, you have something to say there? Well, I'm, I'm going to ask all of us to, um, to consider something. As we look at the Gospels, we know that Matthew was a tax collector. We know that Luke was a doctor. We don't know that much about Mark, but we, can, we, we pretty well assume that he's giving the story as told by Peter. Yeah. And John was the beloved disciple, mm -hmm. but John was also a fisherman, right? And he was also from a priestly family, too. Okay, so he was from a priestly family. That's that's intriguing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But an open question. Do you think a tax collector such as Matthew was good at math? Yeah. Okay, I got I kind of figured you would you would have the answer, but <laughs> the rest of us as as we're thinking about this was a tax collector good at math? Well, his name is Matthew. Right. Agreed. Well, Matthew was one that because of his training was able to explain things to other tax collectors, mm -hmm. to others that were like him so that they could understand the message. Now, we have, we have another man that was, that was part of the disciples, and his name was Simon Zelotus, the, Simon the Zealot. Mm -hmm. He was always looking to overthrow the government of Rome. Mm -hmm. Was he not able to reach others that were looking to overthrow the earthly kingdom to get them to understand that God has placed these over us for his glory. God leads us to people who can relate to us, that we can relate to. Exactly. And, and, yeah, and, and, and that's what God's always done in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, we, it's... Um, I think that we have this sort of sense as Adventists that somehow there's this these talented people who are supposed to do the work of the gospel. But are we also not told that there will be those many of pleasing address that will have nothing to do with a message like this at the end? Yeah, well, that's true. But but I think the, the bigger point for me right now is the fact that God has given each of us a work to do. 
We all have different talents. And and you know, for high yeah. people that she shares with, um, are I don't quite use numbers. She doesn't use numbers, but she can still explain these things to others. I right? generally use principles. Yeah. And and we we connect with people in different ways. And, you know, obviously, I'm not really a, an extroverted person, um, but I've had to learn how to interact with people. But I can only talk about the things I'm interested in. I can't really do small talk. So either I'm teaching people music or I'm telling them about stuff in the Bible or things like that. It's always information. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to be that way. No. Right. In fact, that's the way God didn't create us. He yeah. created us all differently. Yeah. And, and we know that, um, you know, we that God has given us all the talent and that we have to use it. And sometimes that can be quite difficult, especially if we just think I'm not really talented, but just do the things that sometimes it's our children. Sometimes it's our friends. Sometimes it's just people we know and, and we minister. Now, another thing that's important too, um, Often people think that we need to have this big work, you know, and I've run into a lot of people, they, they have these big plans of everything that they want to do for God. But sometimes reaching one person can lead to hundreds of thousands of people being converted. Mm -hmm. An illustration of this is I used to go door to door selling my scripture song albums. And I had one contact that has probably made me $200,000. That's around there. Because through that one contact, um, I ended up with uh, some students, uh, one of whom ended up as a student at Concordia. And because this student came to Concordia and was one of my guitar students, and my guitar teacher had left, and I was still a student my last year, they made me the guitar teacher at Concordia. And so for 20, 21 years, I taught at Concordia, 23 years. I taught at Concordia just from that one contact. So this can happen. Just one person who we influence to know God. We don't know the effect that that one person could have because that one person could be Paul, right? It could be a Paul. It could be, you know, somebody who leads out in the movement. And so we should never, never underestimate God's ability to use simple means, sharing with people our experiences, and his ability to, to do a work that it will be obvious that God has taken the work into his own hands. Right. That it wasn't man who accomplished the work at the end. We cooperated with God. So, you know, hopefully anybody watching this can be encouraged that you have a work to do, and that work may be very simple. But all these things you're studying are important for you to be able to do that work even if you can't remember everything. So hopefully that, uh, that helps others. Okay, so we need to close with prayer. We went pretty long. Um, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, um, we lift up one another in prayer. You know the discouragements that we experience as human beings on this earth. Discouragements that sometimes have to do with our own actions, not just the actions of others. You know that we have neglected, each one of us, to improve the talents that you have given us. But you've also given us an opportunity to redeem the time and that you have given us these truths to enlighten our minds and to draw us to you, to bring a conviction that we need you and to bring a power that we can overcome. 
We pray for this movement, for our friends. We know, Lord, that all of us have been hurt at one time or another by others. We can all justify our actions, but Lord, we ask that you can help us to see ourselves as we truly are and that we can see your love and care for us as well. Be with us through the Sabbath, through the studies that we will participate in, and may your Holy Spirit continue to work upon our hearts and the hearts of those around us. Use us to your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>